Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox Studios. This is Watches Tonight. Guys, this evening we review the best 2022 watch launches so far, the new Omegas, all of them, chat live, and I share your viewer wrist shots right here tonight on Watches Tonight. Remember to check out thewatchbox.com. They are, after all, the people who make my dream job possible, and they may indeed provide your dream watch. Many brands, many styles, many sizes, and many different prices. Not all watches are crazy expensive these days. You will find those as well on thewatchbox.com. Window shop, open a new window, keep me streaming. Check out my Instagram account, guys. This is the action right there. You can binge watch my one minute videos. Over 1,000 posted on Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. So open up two other tabs. Check out thewatchbox.com and Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. Jumping into the box, we have Wolfgang Kohlerer of Austria, Ben S, Dave Open Car. We have got Joel, Mark S from Brooklyn, Matt Foster, Butik One from Poland, John N. Hale Bop. Amit joining from Boston, Jeffrey from Western Massachusetts, Dylan Lamb, Dylan, you're in the wrist chats tonight, and Joe, welcome guys, welcome all, welcome Eric from Southern Utah. Viewer wrist chats number one, I asked you answered, let's check out Neil W. Wins the night with the greatest wrist shot in history. His Bell and Ross in the cockpit of a U.S. Navy F.A. 18 strike fighter. We have Jeff C., a man after my own heart with an AP Royal Oak Offshore Alinghi and a Land Rover Defender, a 90 to be specific, in the best Defender 90 color. Tim Q. stages the Longa Saxonia, a different kind of yellow, yellow gold, bought from Joshua Thanos at Watchbox. Thank you for supporting our company, Tim. Marvin R. and his AP Royal Oak are on a beach in Nassau in the Bahamas. And Adrian B. takes his H. Moser and C. Heritage Center Second Funky Blue out to sea in British Columbia. Guys, thank you so much. Send me more. I have an insatiable appetite for the pieces and the pixels made one. T. Masso at thewatchbox.com or Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. All right. Let's talk about 2022's best watches so far. Clearly, we're still waiting on watches and wonders, which is when we're gonna see Tudor, Rolex, most of the Richemont brands, and Patek Philippe. But we've seen quite a few worthy entries already, many of which are going to be more exciting to guys like me and guys and gals like you than the mainstream offerings from the big brands. So, can you believe we're already one quarter of the way through the year? We haven't talked about the new models in aggregate. Well, let's start right here with one of the best independents in the business, out of Glasuta, Moritz Grossmann. Now, this is the center seconds in purple. Sean, can we go full screen on that? Because this watch is worth the full screen treatment. This is as good as it gets. It, is it our first clue that maybe purple is is the green of 2022. So, from Glasuta, 41 millimeters in stainless steel. They make about 400 watches per year, a little bit less. There will be 25 pieces of this center second purple, and they're gonna cost roughly $27,000 each, which in an era of $120,000 chronomet bleu, seems like a really fair price. So a sunburst purple metallic dial defines the look of the center second purple. It is a lovely royal purple, deep, lush, and brilliant, radiant with a sunburst texture, and the hands live up to Moritz Grossmann's legendary reputation. These components are all fabricated manually and finished manually, needle slim, bright polished, and exhaustively detailed. They are inlaid with a luminescent ceramic, and there is plenty of loom provided on this dial. I wish I could give you a better photo because it's quite a bit more apparent in person. Rest assured, you will have no problem. This is no dress-only time machine. It is fairly described in steel and loomed as an all-around. Rounder. Now we have caliber 100.11. As is the case with all Moritz Grossmann movements, we have freehand engraving on the bridges and plates. We have a lovely broad set of waves, much wider than what you'll find in Geneva. You can also see satination on the wheels, mirrored beveling, fired 
brownish purple screws. They don't do blued screws. They do this lovely violet brown that's achieved by firing the screws for less time. We have an overcoil hairspring and of their own fabrication, a free sprung balance. Manual wind, take a look at the crown and the release trigger next to it. They use a system that allows you to set the hands and then neutralize the setting mechanism so the hands don't budge. You don't need to replace the crown. You pull it out, it snaps back, you set the time with the crown flush, and then you re-engage the drivetrain by pressing that little release trigger so there is no play in the hands after you set them. All of this makes it one of the best new watches of 2022. Let's see what's going on in the box right here. Matt Foster, Mortz Grossmann is growing on me. The Hematic with a bespoke dial, maybe. Got to get one without the three-quarter plate hides the movement. We have right here, Cull Obsidian saying, bring back more purple dials. The OP1 that was discontinued was lovely, and if bigger, I would have bought it. Thomas Von W. Oh, look, Moritz Grossmann put their hands on a Moser watch. Hmm. I don't think Moser does a purple like that. Not, not routinely. They've done it in the past. Uh, but Moritz Grossmann makes a more beautiful movement than Moser. And that's a fact. As much as I love Moser, Mords Grossmann probably makes a better detailed movement than Lange at this point. Okay, high horology, but not in the form you imagined. This was a watch I saw coming a few years back when it reappeared as a one-off at a charity auction. But we have the Gerard Perigo Casquette 2.0. GP is desperate as a brand for a successful relaunch, and this is the first new offering from the newly independent brand, which was purchased back from Caring by its current management, along with Ulysse Narden. So this is a rival, or a revival, I should say. It's going to be a rival of a lot of watches, but it is a revival of the reference 9931 casquette from 1976. From 1976 to 1978, about 8,200 of them were made. They were made in three materials, steel, gold, and macrolon, which was a sort of plastic. Well, the new casquette is made of black ceramic, and it retains a GP manufacture quartz movement, as quartz has been a long-time in-house specialty. Since about 1975 at Gerard Perigo, they've always made their own quartz calibers. The hardware, and there is some hardware here, is made of titanium, so the watch and bracelet, properly speaking, are a hybrid of ceramic, which is scratch resistant, and titanium, which is nice and light. So the watch includes new functions, along with the original time and date. We gain a chronograph, a secret date that will highlight an on-demand day, date, and year. Uh, and we have a second time zone with an expanded calendar. So we have LED display, and it only appears on demand. So it has a two-year battery life, assuming you actuate the LED display 20 times a day. So, 820 units will be offered at a retail price of $4,700, which frankly is quite fair considering what goes into the watch. This is a premium quartz timepiece. It's going to be limited in production. It comes from a genuine high horology brand, and it's a revival of a much-loved sort of watch nerd back catalog special. A lot of folks have long wondered whether the casquette would come back as some sort of a mechanical watch, and now we have our answer. It's coming back as a quartz, but a more capable quartz, and you might be wondering what what is this secret date function? Well, the idea is that you can program a day, date, and month, and then on demand, it will show you, and then when that day, date, and month shows up, it will show itself again automatically. So for example, you may program in an anniversary or a friend or family member's birthday. That's what the secret date is all about in this model. Let's see what's going on in the chat box. Bob G saying, this is a Logan's Run watch. We have a fan of classic sci-fi. We have Brent C joining in from Detroit. We've got John G joining in from Yellowstone country in the American Midwest. You know, I love to see that. We got Davey 85 saying, wow, that's saying a lot about Mords Grossman. I think Langa makes the most aesthetically beautiful, traditionally styled movements in the industry. You're gonna wanna check out Mords Grossman. If you ever had a chance to see them, especially the Hematic and the Tourbillon in person, you'll probably agree there's a little bit more soul and attention to detail in the MG movement than you'll find on an average longa. And then the real two flies saying, still waiting on that pistachio brightling review I can send in mine. You do that, 166 East Levering Mill Road, 
Bala Kenwood, 19004, care of Tim Masso. You send me your watch, I will review your watch. Okay, let's see what else is going on. One more thing about the Gerard Perigo. It has a very cool box. So if you believe that a box and papers should be more than just a receptacle for transport, that's exactly what we have right here. Although it does have a little bit of a Funko Pop doll type packaging look, doesn't it? Okay. H. Moser and C. Now we got a real cool piece here. Endeavor Small Seconds Total Eclipse, an inspired collaboration between Moser and Armory founder Mark Cho. Now Mark's a friend. He's actually been part of my interview series, Collector Conversations, on Watchbox Studios, this channel right here. And he chose a smaller case than is Moser's standard with the Endeavor and pays dividends in elegance. Uh, the more attractive of these two, they're going to make two different versions, incorporates rose gold on the dial, so you get those rose gold accents. Both dials are made from Vanta Black. The dial of each draws on pocket watch inspiration, for example, baton small seconds and a dimple hours with Breguet hands, but it uses a Vanta Black base which absorbs 99.965% of all light, which makes it very, very special in person and almost otherworldly. There is zero branding or extraneous text consistent with Moser's design philosophy of making recognizable watches that have few recognizable trademarks or brandings. So the movement has a case back power reserve indicator. It's a manual wind, it's a three day power reserve, and almost all the branding, the Armory as well as Moser on the case back. And of course, they're going to make two different versions, 28 examples of each. So steel with rose and just straight steel. And each one's gonna be priced at a fairly reasonable $25,900. Yes, in the big frame, that is a lot of money. But again, see every FP Journe ever at this point, and you'll realize this is actually a quite fair price. Let's see what else is going on in the box. We've got C. Flynn joining in from San Diego. A Mick in Florida joining in. We've got Chris Lutz joining in from the Bay Area on America's left coast. And Mark S. opining Vanta Black is awesome. Thomas Burnett saying that the Moritz Grossmann looked great. And I happen to agree with that. Guys, let's try to get our viewership up to like 400 this time. I'm going to move along. This is going to be a fast-paced show because we've got a lot to discuss. Uh, but I want you to stay with me. Let's get up to 400. Sean's good for it. And you guys are too because you supplied me with wrist shots. This is the second installment tonight. Viewer wrist shots number two, starting with Mohammed E. Mohammed showcasing his Rolex Explorer with his daughter's first car. It is a Mini Cooper S crossover. Raymond K. of Dallas prepares for spring break in LA with his IWC Pilot's Watch Chronograph 41 looking good on the full bracelet. Chris K. shows good tastes with his Breitling Colt and Korean pancakes with strawberry ice cream. That is mighty appetizing. I would eat that at any one of the day's three meals or even in between meals. We have Dr. Fahim H. showcasing his Grand Seiko Snowflake while on a camelback tour in the desert of Morocco. And Spencer C. shares his Cartier Pasha C. Big Date and Brass Instruments. Guys, send your wrist shots to mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com. And remember, if you're just joining me now, Follow me on Instagram, Tim underscore Masso, where I post one minute watch reviews, including uh, a bunch of freeze frames from my recent trip to the Amelia Island Concourse. So if you want to see static photos of cool cars, I just put those up too. Okay, what's going on? Adam Crossfire saying, love the Polaris date, especially on the rubber strap. I do like that one, especially the boutique edition. We've got Corentin Coulon saying, hi Tim, I might exchange my Milgauss Z Blue and my Red Sea Dweller on a Pepsi on Jubilee or a Black Sky Dweller on Jubilee, I would not make that trade. I love the two watches you're talking about trading and I don't love the two you're talking about getting. But you're gonna have to follow your heart there because you may feel differently than I do. What else is going on? Watch Addiction Watch Reviews asking what's on the wrist, unpredictable, Zin EZM 1.1. Okay, the Here's some more new watches that I love. Continuing our best new watches of 2022, the Ferdinand Bertou FB2 RSM. This watch, guys, is next level. It combines the FB1's movement with the FB2's round case. So remember, those expressions, FB1, FB2, they describe the case, not the movement inside. 
So we have the same core movement here that includes a tourbillon and a fusée and a chronometer certification, but the finish and detail here are best in the world. You may find different finishing styles, but not higher quality. I've seen this, it lives up to its billing. Nothing is definitively better. Now, Fernand Bertou worked with a watchmaking graduate of the University of Neuchâtel to develop new complications for this movement, deadbeat seconds and hacking seconds. Three variants will be offered, and you can see them here. Each dial is solid white or rose gold, 18 karat, and freehand engraved with all the text and details. 20, by the way, this is the Ferdinand Bertou Marine Chronometer number eight, if you're wondering where the inspiration comes from. 20 movements will be produced, which opens up interesting possibilities. They're gonna make 20 movements, but you can get them in either case, the round FB2, or the you can get it in the FB1 case, which is octagonal and lugless, and wears more like a 40. You can get it in any metal, titanium, sapphire, gold, platinum, or carburized steel, just like my Zin. So you could have that Wunderkund movement in a case that's just as scratch resistant as a Zin. And you're gonna get 53 hours of power reserve, a regulator time display on this movement. There's a lot of features and quirks packed in, all of them beautiful. The price is roughly 290,000 US dollars. And frankly, given that people are paying over half a million dollars for 5711s, Look, it's crazy money to spend on a watch, but crazier money has been spent on lesser watches. That's how I'm going to phrase it. Okay, we've got solidly over 200, 233 watching concurrent. Guys, stay with me. We're going to talk about the Omegas very soon. We got a question from the Layman 35. How do you think new Omega Speedmaster Moonshine Gold prices, green and Panda Dial, are going to shake out? Well, they range between about 34,000 and 36,000 US bucks. It's a lot of watch for the money, but you're mostly paying for gold. I'm not going to lie. We're going to see those watches with full analysis a little bit later in the show. Let's talk about the Laurent Ferrier Sport Auto. So we've known this was coming for three years. Ever since the Grand Sport Tourbillon, we've known that some sort of a cushion case Laurent Ferrier swimmable sports watch was on the way. I saw advanced photos of this at Watch Time New York last fall, and I didn't know what to think about it, but I like it now. So it's 41.5 millimeters in grade five titanium, which is the stuff that's harder than steel. So in other words, it's the good titanium. It is a watch with dial detail that is expressed superbly, 18 karat white gold hands and indices, all applied, lovely granular blue graining, the finishing is pebbly and rustic and wonderful, with a crosshair center, and it's beautifully detailed. There is ample loom, you'll find, so you can see this one easily. Again, I don't have the best loom shot, but magnify that in your imagination and you get the rough idea. Titanium is a welcome alternative to steel in this product class, where we see a lot of big heavy integrated bracelet watches and this is a full bracelet sports watch with a lovely integrated tapered bracelet it manages to not look like a royal oak or a nautilus and laurent ferrier is going to make it in their inimitable fashion which means movement finish will be one of the core attractions i will be honest the Micro Rotor 3-Day Automatic Caliber 27001 is not as ambitious as what you'll find on, for example, the FBN 229, but it is far above what you'll find in this category from the likes of Audemars Piguet, Patek Philippe, and even Vacheron with their Geneva Seal movements. This is on par or better. So don't compare it to the other Galet Micro Rotor Automatics. Compare it to the other options in the sports watch class. Now, there's no question that this is going to be a fantastic all-arounder as it's loomed, automatic, light on the wrist, hypoallergenic, and it's 120 meters water resistant, so it matches the water resistance of the Nautilus and Aquanaut while being immensely more water resistant than the chronically 50 meter Royal Oaks. Now, 
The price is $49,500, which given the finishing of the movement and the low volume, Laurent Ferrier makes less than 200 watches a year, I think that is a reasonable number. When you add the markups on the usual suspects, remember, a blue dial overseas automatic right now is a $65,000 watch, so that's no longer a bargain. Given where the other players in the segment are right now, this makes a lot of sense. Maybe a $50,000 sports watch is crazy, but the other ones are insane. Sanity, after all, in this market market is relative. All right, guys, we got Thomas Burnett saying absolutely love Laurent Ferrier. The Traveler GMT watch they did last year was great. We've got Omarion 07. Tim, when did Rolex develop the first in-house movement? Is it after Agler developed movements exclusively for Rolex and changed the name of the facility to Rolex Beale? Well, Rolex had in-house movements at least as early as the 1930s because they were experimenting with in-house chronographs back then with the Zerograph and uh, the 4113. But in terms of series production, it was more like a continuum where they started making more and more of the watches in-house over time. They finally bought up the Agler works in 2004, and after that point, everything they put in their movement was entirely in-house. Um, and finally, with the Paraflex shock protection, everything from the shock protection to the lubricants is in-house. But it was more of a continuum, starting, I would say, probably in the 30s through 2004, when they finally brought all that capability under one Rolex roof. Guys, we're almost at 300 live. This is going to be a good show. Let's keep this going. Guys, stay with me. You're going to have some fun here, starting with viewer wrist shots number three. We're almost at the Omegas. Eric R. and his SUF Vetteheinen, the mermaid in Finnish, endorsed the Stepan Sarpaneva School of Sports Watch Design. Quentin B., a great supporter of my social media and my Facebook highlights a rarely seen Omega, his 2006 DeVille Chronoscope, which is a favorite of mine. Brandon K. impresses with his American Hamilton 944 pocket watch. Looking good. I'm actually learning watchmaking on pocket watches, so this is a man after my own heart. We have Dylan L., one of our good friends. He's at the bench learning his craft with his Rolex Air King 116900. And we got Derek D. from Ireland with his H. Moser and C. Pioneer Center Seconds while watching Ireland versus England in football. Guys, send your wrist shots to mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com. I love to showcase the watches you have. I don't care if it's Raketa, Poljot, Swatch, Grubel 4C, whatever you've got, I try to pick a broad range but I probably get 100 submissions for every 20 that go up on the show. Don't stop sending them. You'll eventually make it up. Okay, 2022 Omega Watch is explained. Recall that it was four years ago that Swatch dealt the first of what became a series of death blows to the Basel World wristwatch trade show by pulling all of its brands out and initially planning to exhibit at its own time to move trade show, canceling that, and then deciding that the best way to launch watches was just to push them straight to the internet and to the magazines. Since that time, there has been no consistent group-wide release strategy within Swatch. Their brands tend to push out internet photos and test watches when they feel like it, sometime between January and December of any given model year. But Omega's 2022 product strategy appears to be simply launch first. Launch before everyone else. Launch before your competitors from Breitling and Rolex. Launch before the other Swatch Group brands. Launch before the big trade show in Geneva at the end of March. So, in lieu of an actual trade show or some sort of major press junket, we get Omega Days this year, which are almost entirely virtual. And the new watches are hitting the web to make first impressions. Here are the models that will warrant collector interest the most. Now, there were also two sub 30 millimeter ladies dress watch series, but I'm guessing that the interest level here on this show will be low enough that I can skip them. In fact, most women I know who like watches, who truly love watches and collect them, will probably just as soon skip that stuff too and go straight to the men's watches. Okay, so 2019, we're gonna look back before we can look forward, brought an Omega concept watch called the Planet Ocean Deep Professional. So the Planet Ocean Ultra Deep Professional, let me get that right, effectively it was Omega's answer to Rolex's dead end deep sea challenge. They made five of those, none hit the market. 
That was a 12,000 meter diver of 2012. But at 28 millimeters thick, the 15,000 meter rated Planet Ocean Ultra Deep looked like a dead end publicity stunt in its own right. After all, a one inch thick watch is a little bit beyond the pale even for a big arm. So here are just the facts. Fast forward to 2022 and the Seamaster family has a new flagship, the Planet Ocean Ultra Deep, and there are several different variants. Okay, the new watch is 45.5 millimeters in diameter and available in either grade five titanium or Omega steel, as they're calling it, which is designed to be brighter, hold the polish better, and be more resistant to salt water-based corrosion. In other words, this is a response to Rolex's 904L steel and Zinn's U-boat steel. It is a steel you don't need to rinse after salt exposure. So Omega here employs a solid case back for hermeticity, as well as to pare down the thickness of the old prototype from 28 millimeters to a still frankly monstrous 18.1 millimeters. And here's the interesting thing. They rate it for saturation diving and in a throwback to the 1970s Ploprof, it is said to be so hermetically sealed that it doesn't need a gas escape valve. The idea here being that gas cannot get in, so with no ingress, there need be no egress. That is a risky bet, but Omega is putting its money, and perhaps yours, where its mouth is. Gradient dials, by the way, are now a thing on Planet Ocean dive watches. At least they are with this series. And take note that there are no dates on these watch faces. Everything possible has been done to pare down the thickness of these monstrous machines. Now, dials are either going to be gloss lacquer, because Omega's standard ceramic dials are actually quite thick, or they're going to be titanium with fume fades, which is what we have right here. And all dial furniture on this flagship model is white gold. That's logo, that's hands, and that's indices. So we have several options. Bracelets, which you can see are integrated and include uh, double deployant dive clasps with both sliders and fold outs. We can get rubber if we wish, and that uses a conventional lug junction. And then there is a textile strap option, uh, but take note, the case design changes if you get the strap. That is titanium with a strap. If you get the strap, the lug is permanently altered. I don't know if we can go back to the case back shot we had before, but you will see from the back end shot of Sean can pull that up, that the lugs are of a very different geometry than the model with the rubber strap or the bracelet. So this is a standalone model, which explains why the titanium does not include a bracelet option. Okay, so you've seen your options. What doesn't change from model to model is that you get a 60 hour automatic winding, master chronometer certified, caliber 8912, which is like an 8900, but without the date. It's highly anti-magnetic, it's shock resistant, and in this 6,000 meter watch, it's also quite water resistant. The full bracelet's gonna cost you $11,600, which kind of surprised me because the titanium on a strap is gonna cost you $12,300. It's actually a lot more expensive. And if you want steel with a rubber strap, you find the most attractive option price-wise, and that will be $11,200 US dollars. Now, that's a big watch. A lot of folks are gonna buy this as a weekend watch, a party watch, or an event watch. Maybe something they will in fact actually take diving. But if you want the everyday Omega Diver, Omega's got something for you in 2022. Less aggressive, more wearable, still 42 millimeters. It's the Diver 300 meter, now available in green. It's like the Hulk, but with more bulk. So we have a ceramic green dial and bezel insert that do call to mind the Rolex Submariner Date Hulk. But you can see here that the resemblance isn't as close as some online pundits are suggesting. Sean, if we could jump back between those two, the shape of the dial, the shape of the watch, the fact that one is gloss, one's metallic, one's ceramic, one's what Rolex calls green gold, they are very different. And I think there's enough room in the world for both. Tech specs, it's a caliber 8800, 55 hour reserve, helium escape valve, 300 meter diver, display case back, anti-magnetic master chronometer, all of those things. And two models are available, 
One matches the dial color with a rubber strap. That's $5,100 full bracelet. You've got to pay the upcharge, guys. It's only $300, $5,400. Even if you love it on the strap, do yourself a favor. Get it on the bracelet. The price delta at Omega to get the bracelet, it's $300. That's like the cost of buying a strap for most brands. If you want it on a strap, buy it on the bracelet, put the bracelet back in the box, and buy the strap as an accessory. It's just the way to do it. Okay, now 2019 also brought a new material uh, for Omega. We saw that original Ultra Deep back in 2019, and we also saw the 50th anniversary Moonwatch, which gave us Moonshine Gold. So initially, it was offered only as a garnishing on the 50th anniversary Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch. Now, the Extra Pale Moonshine graces an entire collection of Speedmaster Professional Moonwatches. And yes, the new Moonwatch looks an awful lot like an existing Rolex, and it is hard to deny. That said, the new Moonwatch is a manual winding NASA-derived classic that is still flown in space in its steel variants, and it has the heritage behind it to shake off the Rolex comparisons. I think this is a cool offering if you've got the coin. A display case back reveals that mechanically nothing changes. Coaxial, anti-magnetic, master chronometer certified, Lamagna based caliber 3861 unchanged from steel stock. Now, prices are ambitious, ranging from $24,600. This is the most basic version, strap, green dial, all the way up to $36,500. This model is full bracelet, full moonshine gold, and even the dial here is a wonderfully whimsical gold panda. It is a solid medallion of gold, like a, like a gold dollar or gold $20. It is a full gold watch and it is very cool. Now, 36 and a half thousand bucks is a lot of money, but go back to that Rolex 116508 and see what those are going for used right now. All of a sudden, the Omega makes a lot more sense. Viewer wrist shots, number four. I asked you answer, starting with Joe and Jack from Chicago. They're out on the rink at the match with the tandem. Rolex and Tudor, let's call it Rolex and Tudor on ice. All right, Christian H and his Rolex Air King, are at the Kings at Resort World Las Vegas looking good. That is the immortal Elvis. He may be in Vegas, but that is not Vegas era Elvis. That is like 50s Elvis. That's cool Elvis. Uh, that's Jailhouse Rock Elvis, not Blue Hawaii. Okay, let's take a look at Mike P. of Omaha, Nebraska. Shares his newly acquired Zenith era Rolex Daytona two-tone, and I've long said that the two-tone Zenith Daytonas are the ultimate buy in vintage collectible Rolex. We have Armin R. and his Swiss Army watch joining alongside his dream car, a 1960 Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud II, uh, well chosen in both cases. We have Ari S. and his vintage Rolex Date 8 Stella Dial diamond set hitting the links in the great outdoors. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Let's see, where are me? Guys, we're there. 419 concurrent viewers. You never let me down. Best audience on YouTube. No trolls, all enthusiasts and loyal. You guys are the reason I have the world's best job. Abdul R. from Germany saying, nice, that Zenith Daytona is awesome. We got our man Wolfgang still in the box, sticking with me. And we've got Josip saying, clear where the inspiration came from, but Omega overdid the original in all categories. Green SMP for sure. Let's see where to have to throw my money additionally. Uh, what else is going on here? We've got Amit saying, Tim, what do you think is a better brand to buy from a value retention standpoint? Moritz Grossmann, Laurent Ferrier, or Chapek? Well, I would say if you're buying a sports watch, Chapek. If you're buying a dress watch, Moritz Grossmann. If you think that a buyer is gonna come along and swoop up Laurent Ferrier and turn them into Chapek or FP Journe, then maybe Laurent Ferrier is the long play. But right now, for sports watches, Chapek. For dress watches, Moritz Grossmann. I think both of those brands are going places. We've got Talai Sikar asking, Tim, what are your favorite independents? What is your favorite independent? For me, it is Debitune, and it has been for 
most of the last decade. I live in a dream world where my employer buys my favorite independent watch brand. Does this happen at your office? I didn't think so. All right, jumping back to our regularly scheduled program. For fans of sporty all-arounders, Omega offers a ceramic dial now, a white ceramic dial on its recently launched 41 millimeter constellation. At 6,500 US dollars, this is an appealing budget alternative to watches like the Rolex Datejust 41, which is both more expensive and unobtainable in steel. While the Connie 41 was pitched as a serious offering to men, the gentle colors and appearance of this particular example do seem a little bit more geared toward women with a taste for men's watches and men's sizes. Now, some additional dial variants and case variants have been launched here at up to $8,700 if you want one of the two-tone models, and yes, you can get them on a rubber strap to make them a little bit sportier. That said, the new Aqua Terra is a serious pitch to win sales from frustrated Rolex Datejust and Oyster Perpetual in tenders. Clearly, Omega witnessed the response to Rolex's 2021 Oyster Perpetual Stella dials. The response was immense and turned the OP into a sexy weightlisted watch for the first time ever. So with Omega, both 34 and 38 millimeter versions are offered and it's clear that the 34 millimeter set includes a lighter and softer palette of pastel colors than the intensely vivid 38 millimeter set, which I'm reading is a bit more geared towards male buyers. These watches undercut the Rolex Oyster Perpetual 41, that's the 38 in green, but they undercut the OP41 at $6,000, which in theory, is 150 bucks less than an OP41, but the real world price and availability of the new Aquaterra and OP is destined to be far greater than that theoretical $150 price difference. We all know that the Tiffany dial OP is now a $35 to $40,000 watch, and frankly, as nice as it is, I would rather just buy one of these for six grand with the standard Omega Aquaterra 10% discount. Okay, finally, we reached my favorite 2022 Omega collection, and this is a good one. We first saw the Speedmaster 57 back in 2013. Well, the redesigned 57 corrects most of the deficiencies of the original. So Omega launched the original 57 in 13 before it started rolling out actual vintage Speedmaster tributes. And once we started getting watches like the 2998 and the CK2915, um, the 57 had flexibility to be less of a literal historic homage and more of a playful riff on historic Omega references. And that's exactly what we have in the new collection. In theory, there are eight different permutations as we get four different dials, and you can get them on bracelets or you can get them on straps. Here are the basic dial color options. So there's one traditional variant in the spirit of the 2013 models, and it's a little bit more retro. It has a Panerai-like sandwich dial construction with a stencil on top of, of a loomed disc, and it looks really good. But I will say that all of these dials look like dynamite, but all these dials look like dynamite, but all these dials are not created equal. I think the red dial is the best. It is a unique burgundy PVD that creates a special matte texture to set it apart from the brushed Sunray blue metallic and green dial models. So those are cool, but for me, this one here is the winner. Uh, for the first time in what seems like decades, too, we have a new generation Omega model that is thinner than the outgoing generation. The Speedmaster 57 is now only 12.99 millimeters thick, thanks to a transition from automatic winding to manual winding with the new caliber 9906. Technically, nothing changes but the automatic winding. It's a little bit bare and a clear conversion from an automatic movement, not a purpose-built manual, but it's slim enough that I dig what they're doing and I appreciate that they did it. Now, the case diameter also decreases. The watch goes from 41.5 millimeters now to 40.5, and I think it's fair to say that this is probably what the watch should have been back in 2013, but we live, we learn, and Omega has undoubtedly improved the Speedmaster 57 while making it more distinct from other retro inflected Speedmasters currently in production. So eight steel variants are available. You can get a bracelet or you can get a strap. If you get the strap, the strap has a cool gradient
gradient fade from inside out. But again, as is common with Omega, the price delta between a strap and a bracelet is so small that I'm begging you, if you go out and get one of these, get it on the bracelet and then just get the strap as an accessory. So it's $8,300 on a strap, it's $8,600 for the full bracelet, and that is the way to get it. And I believe that there's now a micro adjust built into this bracelet, another improvement on the original. Guys, you moved mountains and so did Sean. There were over 80 images in this episode. This was a big one. Next week, we're talking Rolex predictions for watches and wonders. And the week after that, Patek Philippe predictions as we ramp up to wall-to-wall -wall coverage here on Watchbox Studios of Watches and Wonders 2022. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com and remember to follow me, Tim underscore Masso, on Instagram. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.